Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, this session is about uh, building a secure and uh, efficient vision sensing uh, application with uh, WASM, WebAssembly. Uh, and it's gonna, I'm going to talk about all the challenges uh, around it and, that, and our ideas on how to solve the, those problems with uh, uh, Sony's IoT platform. So this talk is going to be divided up into two, uh, two parts. So first part is going to be about the application development at the edge, and the second part is going to be about the uh, challenges around AI. So introduction about ourselves, uh, I'm Ryu, I'm the uh, director of the ecosystem development at Midokura. And uh, my colleague here is Ekaterina, she's the, uh, an AI engineer at Midokura. So a little bit about Midokura. So we started off uh, as a, a startup in 2010. So back then we were doing an SDN, Software Defined Networking, uh, which is uh, with an integration with OpenStack. And that was you know, obviously very different from what we're doing now. Uh, in 2019, we were acquired by SSS, which is Sony Semiconductor Solutions, who at the time had the biggest market share in image sensors. So the idea was that sort of we bring the virtualization from the cloud all the way to the edge where the sensors are. So this way you can sort of run workloads on the devices where the sensors exist, where the data is generated. So that's exactly what we did. So in a couple of years, uh, last year actually, we launched uh, uh, Itrius, which is the uh, Division uh, Edge AI platform by Sony. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. <clears throat> okay, so. So I just, you know, that includes a lot of things. It has a bunch of cloud services. Uh, it's got the SDK and a, and a software stack on the device. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the device side because this is about, you know, the edge AI application development that runs on a device, not the cloud. So how common is uh, AI at the edge, right? or doing AI at the edge, uh, in particular for uh, vision sensing data? Well, we are a member of the uh, um, Edge AI and Vision Alliance. And every year they do this survey where, well, for a bunch of questions. One of them, which, one of them is this, uh, the use of a neural network at the edge. <clears throat> so as you can see, in less than 10 years, it went from uh, less than 40% to almost 90. So uh, this is becoming the norm, okay? So, so what does it take to do this, right? So it's, it's not just running an AI uh, inference at the edge but it also requires building an application for it. So what makes the Edge app development difficult? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, explain a, a few reasons why that's the case. Okay, the first one is pretty obvious. The, uh, the IoT devices are very uh, resource constrained. So when I say Edge, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm gonna include uh, constrained Edge is what they call. You know, not just like the network Edge, but the constrained Edge, these MCUs. But now, within these constrained edge, there, there are levels, right? So if you look at the, so these are some of the commonly used IoT devices uh, that I pulled out. And if you look at the ones on top, you will see that they're extremely limited in, in, in memory. So based on experience, it's the memory that is always the limiting factor for running a, a sort of a vision processing application. So if you go to that much constrained devices, then it's pretty clear that you can't do much. Now, let's say you take the ESP32, this particular model here, which has eight megabytes. Now, now we're talking, right? You can do something interesting. Now, but if you still compare that to Raspberry Pi, for example, then that's up to eight gigabytes of memory, it's, it's magnitude less, right? So um, you can imagine from, as a developer's perspective, you still have to be very conscious of the, of the uh, constraint. And what's interesting also is this NXP's uh, crossover MCUs. So, so this series has, has many different models, but I just took one. Uh, so it has, uh, it's kind of like, it, st it still um, runs like an MCU, it's powered by, you know, as like an MCU and, and low cost, but it has like the complexity of the pro uh, application processor. So it, like, it might come with an NPU, it might come with codec. So, you know, we, we think this might be like a sweet spot for the sort of like what we're trying to do. You know, so we'll see. But still, despite all that, it is still very challenging for developers because these are very constrained environment you gotta write your application on. 
And not only that, there's a, in IoT, there's a huge fragmentation of devices, right? So look at the list of operating systems and, uh, and architectures and, and the communication protocols here. So in IoT, you'd have some combinations of these, right? And it's very fragmented. So from the developer's perspective, you have to code against one of these combinations. So you have to be aware of the hardware and, and execution environment that you're writing your application for, right? As, as compared to, say, you're, you're, you're coding for the cloud, where mostly you, you, you probably you know, care about Linux and x86, and that's it, right? So this, uh, this, so this kind of leads to um, a non-portable code, right? So you have to write one for each of these combinations. Security is also a big concern in IoT. Now, in particular, we, uh, we looked at this data. This is from uh, uh, Smart Homes data from last year. Uh, Memory-related issues are sort of very common. Okay, so the second place here is a, is a buffer overflow. So when you have an attack, an attack of this kind, you have, you know, you could actually easily break the device, so to speak, and break it, right, where it requires like a firmware upgrade or, uh, um, yeah, uh, upgrade or maybe replace the device itself. Or you could potentially, inject, you know, somebody might inject uh, malicious code in there. So Microsoft also did, does this study every year where they, they found that 70% of all the, uh, the CVEs, uh, they are memory related. And it's been like that for a while. And one of the things they say is that it's, it's the reason is mostly these attacks are against C, C++ code, right? Obviously, right? So now this is a problem in embedded because in embedded, C and C++ are still the most dominant languages for, you know, for performance reasons. But this also conflicts with the reality, right, of the developers right now. So here's, a, here's the uh, data from Stack uh, Overflow last year. You see that the, these dynamic languages are the most popular. In particular, we care about Python because we're talking about edge AI application development. And Python is by far the most popular languages that the AI developers use. Reason being, if you look at the right side, you have uh, you know, co mo very popular libraries like NumPy, for example. You know, this is, a, this is a, a very popular library that the AI developers need, and uh, Python provides that. So there is this misalignment, you know, a gap between embedded, and embed you know, embedded developers and AI developers. So how, how, do we close, how do we close the gap? So uh, I want to uh, introduce WebAssembly, which, is, uh, which we believe is a great solution to all these problems. Right? And, and uh, I'm going to explain how, how this technology sort of solves these. Well, in case you guys don't know about WebAssembly, it's a, it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Uh, it is a uh, compilation target for many programming languages. Right, so it is uh, it's portable by design. Uh, so it's, it's a sandboxing technology. You know, so, so it's kind of similar to containers. It provides isolation between, you know, across devices, I mean, uh, applications. But it's much more lightweight. Okay, it's much more lightweight. And, and the size of, of WASM module is probably magnitude smaller than container applications, which needs to probably pull in a bunch of dependencies into the, into the image. Right, so, so it's a very lightweight. So now, uh, so we're looking for a very lightweight application, a small application. This is WebAssembly provides that. So in 2013, it was actually Mozilla introduced it as, so they introduced uh, uh, ASM.js in 2013, which is sort of like a highly optimizable subset of JavaScript that runs in a browser. So that was like a precursor to WebAssembly when they decided in 2017 that they should just come up with a new set of binary instruction set, okay, which became WebAssembly. And now WebAssembly, or WASM, is, uh, is a standard in W3C. And uh, it's, uh, so there's also Bicode Alliance, which is uh, an organization sort of focusing on the actual implementation of the WASM specifications. And Midokura is actually uh, a member of Bicode Alliance. So WebAssembly is also a highly portable, right, as I said. So it basically runs anywhere where there's a runtime. And this, this, you know, this not just the browser, but outside of the browser. So if you look at the data here, Already, from this one last year, you know, IoT is the third most common you know, uh, use case of, of WebAssembly, which is great. So we have small applications, but how about the runtime itself? 
Right? So there are actually many runtimes in WebAssembly to choose from. Now, uh, luckily, so there is a WebAssembly runtime that is targeting specifically the microcontrollers. It's called WAMR. It's, I think it stands for WebAssembly Micro Runtime. I, it's, uh, it is fully compliant to WASM spec and uh, provides a, a very a near native speed with uh, support for AOTs ahead of time compile. And uh, to run these AOT files, it actually only requires less than 30K of runtime footprint, which is great for these MCUs. And as you can see, it has a, has a rich support of all these architectures and operating systems. So this is what we chose. OK, so as I said, uh, WASM is portable. So, that's right. so ultimately, we want to achieve this uh, right once, run anywhere concept, even on IoT devices. Right? This is what we want, because it's so fragmented. It is portable by design, but how about if the application needs to sort of access host resources or native libraries and, and, and things like that? Because well, you do, because, for example, if you want to fetch image, an image from a sensor, because we're building a, a AGI app, right? Well, how do you do it? Like, if, the, if the sensor API is different for different sensors, then you, now you have non-portable application, right? Because you, you, have to, you have to code against every single different interfaces. So there is a uh, thing called WASI, which, is a, which stands for uh, WebAssembly Standard System Interfaces. Uh, so this is a good set of standard interfaces for applications, WebAssembly applications to, to, uh, to use so for things like, so it started off being like a POSIX-like API, like uh, you know, system clocks and files and sockets and things like that. But now you can see there's standard inter interfaces for things like WASI NN, which is a neural network API. So you can do an inference on that. There's also HTTP, and, and if you can see on the right side here, you know, it's, it's, you have key value store, SQL, so it's getting kind of high level API now. So it, it sort of includes both. But WASI NN is in particular very important for us because, you know, so if you want to do edge AI, it, it is an API that you need to have to, a standard API that you need to have to actually invoke that inference. Okay, so how about security? Well, WebAssembly is also great for that. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, it provides isolation. And uh, so, you know, when you, have, when you run multiple applications on the same device, you know, these MCUs typically don't come with memory management units, right? So you don't get, each application doesn't get a, a, a virtual, you know, virtual memory space. So basically, you, you can't run multiple applications, they're gonna step on each other. But with the WebAssembly, you get, you know, every module gets its own memory space, so, that's, so you get that. So you get a full isolation of memory, that's great. Uh, also, what if you wanna access anything on the host? Or, or from another module, right? So in WebAssembly, this is also very secure by design because any access to the, to the running module has to be explicitly granted, otherwise you cannot access it. So by default, you can't access anything outside of Sandbox. This is, this is a, a, a good design for IoT use case because there's actually an interesting study here in containers where it says, eight, for, it's from Sysdig last year, I think, yeah. For 87% of the container images actually have uh, critical vulnerabilities, but only 50% of it is actually in use during runtime. So basically, you're pulling in a lot of dependencies and, and libraries that you don't you probably, you probably don't, don't use and don't need, but it contains a lot of lot of stuff that you don't want to have in there. But with WebAssembly, the you know you, you, because you're only allowing the, the modules to access things that are granted, you're really limiting the path to vulnerability. You know, it's a much safer design. Okay, so. Uh, Support for different languages. Okay, so uh, what's great about WebAssembly is that you know maybe one of the one of the attractive things about it is that for embedded now you can go beyond C C and C plus plus developers. Now, how is uh, uh, is the Python support? Well, it's actually already it's the fourth most popular language in WASM. Okay, so this is great. So now we can support Python in uh, you know uh, embedded, but that's not exactly the case, right? So we don't want to just run Python as WASM. But we want to run it on tiny IoT devices, okay? So we, we tried a few things here. So you could just, if it's a simple Python application, you could just compile it into WASM and run it. You could transpile Python into C, C++, and then compile to Python uh, to, to WASM and run it. But if you do this, for very simple stuff you can, but then you don't really get full features of, of Python. And if you want to do, if you want the full feature of it, you want to actually do the whole, comp you have to compile the C Python, the interpreter of Python, and run it. And it's what a lot, I think this is what a lot of most people do these days. So this works, but the problem is the, 
we measured the, the uh, you know, ahead of time Watson file that, that this generated, it was 20 megabytes. So this is not, we can't run this on IoT devices, right? So, but that being said, uh, WebAssembly is, has a, and there's a strong support in Python community. In CPython now, there's, is, now WASI is a t tier two support in, uh, in CPython, which means every breaking change that goes in has to be either fixed or, or reverted back within 24 hours. So that's great. Uh, and there's also a Bicode Alliance uh, special interest group dedicated to um, supporting dynamic languages like Python. It's called SIG Guest Languages. So if you're interested, please take a look. So strong support is coming, which is great. But how about on IoT devices in Embedded? Well, there's still hope because uh, there is this uh, thing called MicroPython, which is it's, like, it's a Python for microcontrollers. It's a subset of Python standard libraries that are sort of are optimized for microcontrollers. So it, it also includes a NumPy-like uh, library called ULab. And when we, did the comp when we compiled this WASM, it was only 1.5 megabytes, so that's great. So, there's a, this is a, this is so, so what it looks like is for MCU, this might be the choice. And maybe for something like Raspberry Pi, maybe we can do you know, CPython. So, uh, so WebAssembly solves many of these edge uh, app development. I hope I was convincing, but uh, now we had to sort of put everything together, right? So now this is where I'm gonna mention uh, iTrius and how we do so. So a, a key component in iTrius is, is Sony's intelligent vision sensor. It's called IMX500. So one way to, to sort of reduce the, the AI computation on the, on the, on the resource-constrained MCU is to have its image sensor do it for you. Right, so uh, IMX500 is a, is a stack sensor structure combining, like, combining the image sensor and uh, like a powerful DSP with on-chip memory. It's up to eight, eight megabytes. And so when the, Im when the image comes in, the, the AI logic chip does the inference for you. So by the time it reaches the MCU, you only have to do the post-processing because the inference has been done for you. You, only get the you already get the result and the image, and that's it, post-processing. So, um, this really helps reducing the computation necessary on MCU. Now, iJuris does work with, you know, our system doesn't require IMX500, but this is the way to sort of optimize it. So, uh, what does it look like on a device stack? Okay, so this is a software stack on a device. The modules on top, these are WebAssembly modules that are running on top of uh, the runtime, which is a Whammer. And you, you still need an agent to sort of do the orchestration of these modules, like your deployment, um, you know, status reporting, things like that. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, options here. ByteHive is something that we offer. It's an open source project. It's in the process of being open source. Uh, this name is tentative because it's not open source yet. Uh, so it's kind of like a cubelet of, of Kubernetes, but it's but on IoT. Uh, Orker is another one that's, al that's also that's a, a Linux uh, LF Edge official project, I think it, was, uh, it became official a couple of months ago. So, you know, we don't, you can use any of these things. So, so WASI is a, a standard interface, as I mentioned. Uh, so you do have to, if you have IMX500 here, but you, you could have other sensors, right? So the goal was make, uh, decouple the applications from the sensors, right? That's what we wanted to do. So WASI is one way, so we have a uh, well-defined interface for sensors. And secondly, we, we also provide an open source a sensor and an ISP library called SenseCord, right? So this is this sort of this is sort of layer that provides support for multiple sensors, and also functionality, rich functionalities for the applications. And on and on the top, you have a WASI that provides the uh, standard interface. So this is like the total like overview of the development environment uh, for HRS locally. So you you know you you have to you know you you want to grab one of these. Cameras that have IMX 500. So on the bottom, it's going to be are there? They're ESP32 MCUs. Uh, you have Raspberry Pi support now, so you have to see one at the top. And uh, on the left side, you see the SDK, iTrius SDK, Edge, app, Edge AI app SDK. Uh, that contains everything that I talked about before: orchestration agent, uh, Whammer, um, what is it, SenseCord, all that stuff, right? And also the uh, language support. Right now, we only support C, C++, but we are working on supporting Python and other languages, um, like for example, Rust. You know, it's a very popular language, and I think it's very, it's a very, Rust. I personally think is a great language for embedded, um, but we'll see. Uh, let's see, uh, and also for any vision 
type of application, you need to have uh, GUI. Right? So Local Console is a tool that we recently open source. You can get the code there. So you launch that, you connect the devices, and it manages up to five devices, and you can sort of deploy applications, um, see the, uh, the images and, and the inference output and so forth. And if you want to scale more than five, and if you want to go to hundreds of devices, we do have a cloud service, uh, the iGIRS cloud service that uh, gives you fleet management and also like rich AI services. Okay, so that's my part, and I'm gonna hand over to Ekaterina for the AI challenges. Thanks. Thank you, Ru. So now that uh, Ru talked to you about the challenges of uh, developing edge AI applications and how WASM helped to solve them, let me focus more on the AI part. Some of the materials might be familiar to you if you have already worked with edge devices. So the challenges start on the step of bringing model to the edge. Maybe you have a very good model working greatly on cloud, your laptop, NVIDIA Jetson, but then you decide, can I bring it to Raspberry Pi, ASP32, or some other edge device? How do I do that? How do I make it ready for my edge device? So the workflow is more or less the following. Um, you build the float model, optimize the model, convert, package, and deploy it. Some of those steps might go together in one tool, but here we explicitly split them uh, into several because basically this is how uh, it works for IMX 500. Um, yeah, so uh, first step is building the float model in your uh, framework of choice, which is usually TensorFlow or PyTorch. Then there is an optimization step where you perform quantization, compression of the model. Afterwards, you compile it, uh, compile the obtained model to the binary format that will be deployed on the device. And then you package it and you can deploy it. This is very similar to what happens with other devices. Let's consider, for example, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and Coral. Uh, you can use TFLight converter for the optimization step, and in case of Raspberry Pi and Arduino, you usually don't even have to do additional conversion step. Uh, you just uh, deploy the TFLight file. Uh, in case of Coral, that is similar in restrictions to IMX500 in the sense that it has eight megabytes of memory, you have this additional conversion step with HTPU compiler. Yes, I know converter compiler uh, might sound confusing, but bear with me. Uh, the deployment is usually um, either I IoT platform, ID, manual upload. So what is the difference? Those tools usually imply that you run the inference in your application. You have a common camera uh, where you extract, where you fetch the image, and then uh, you have to use, uh, you have to perform the inference on your application, be it TFLite inter TF interpreter, ONX runtime, um, YCNN, something else. In case of using uh, intelligent uh, vision sensor, uh, the logic for uh, inference is happening on the DSP. So uh, you only, in the application, you only have to fetch uh, image or metadata uh, from the corresponding channel. So your application can be much smaller and focus on the logic of post-processing or some business logic that you want to implement. But of course, your model needs to be uh, according to intelligent vision sensor um, uh, specifications. Right. We shift the uh, inference logic to the IMX500. But it is 8 megabytes. Uh, can we really run the same models on it that we will run on a CPU? Let's see. So these 8 megabytes imply that your AI operations, like model uh, parameters and feature tensors, should not take more than this amount. Additional uh, constraints is that only static models are supported. 
like uh, no loops and no uh, conditional operations. Additional restriction on the input, ten uh, input tensor of the model that in case of uh, RGB will be 640 by 640. For grayscale, it's a bit bigger. Uh, and then there is a constraint on the set of supported layers. I don't specify it here, but uh, by looking for uh, layer coverage IMX500, you can uh, find their list for PyTorch and TensorFlow, and I think it's pretty extensive. Sounds pretty restrictive, right? Well, once again, if you use Coral, you have a similar uh, challenger, but still, even with those constraints, you can cover main uh, AI vision tasks, such as classification, object detection, pose estimation, and segmentation. And uh, if you're interested which kind of model can be used there, uh, Model Compression Toolkit provides some tutorials with examples of those models so that you can try them. But let's assume you want to implement your own model. By now it's clear that it should be a lightweight model. So how do you achieve that? Well, you can start by uh, ensuring that the backbone of your model is a uh, lightweight. So it's like mobile net, squeeze net, rest net, some others. Then you need to replace uh, some operations with their more memory efficient uh, implementations, like convolution should be replaced with depth-wise uh, convolu depth separable convolution, which by now should really be a standard. Um, the other step will be redefining the modules to take into account the previous step and to improve its efficiency. Sometimes we also do pruning by taking out um, excessive heads or layers in between. Um, separate uh, useful approach is knowledge distillation, when if you have a big model that you know performs very well on your task and you have some example of a model uh, that would fit IMX 500, you just uh, distill all the knowledge to the student. And of course, let's not forget about quantization. Quantization, by the way, is taken care of by the uh, model compression toolkit. So yes, uh, those techniques can be either taken into account by you when developing your own model, or implemented in some uh, intermediate tools provided by ITROS, either inside the uh, training service, or conversion, uh, or converter, or compression toolkit. Okay, this sounds like a lot of work maybe, right? Uh, but I assure you that the models that you obtain uh, will provide you um, opportunity to implement some interesting uh, use cases. Let me show you some of them. Here I will focus not only on deploying model on the device, but on the general solution. So it's a combination of a model, application, and device. The first success case is the one we presented in WASM-EO earlier this year. The setup was as follows. We had two cameras with the parameters specified above that were looking on the, um, on the toy race car track. And uh, they were performing inference independently, but simultaneously. And you can see that uh, those two devices that we used, first of all, they differed in, uh, in the fact that ESP32 used the smart trans uh, sensor and Raspberry Pi used the regular camera. And they also differed a lot uh, in the memory size. In our setup, we used the same model, MobileNet V2 SSD up to conversion of course, to the corresponding uh, um, device. And then uh, we also reused a lot of modules from WASM, like uh, fetching uh, information from the sensor and performing the post-processor, post-processing, 
As, and as a result, we saw that uh, those two devices with such great difference in memory were performing equally good. So first of all, small device was sufficient uh, to perform this task, and it was really saving us memory. And equally good, both in terms of uh, coordinates of the detected bounding boxes and uh, the uh, number of telemetries sent uh, from the device, as you can see on this graph. So it brings us to the conclusion that uh, using the IMX500 helps us to reduce the memory uh, workload on the device and allows us either use a smaller device or implement a more elaborated uh, logic on, uh, on a bigger device. And this is what we did in the other success case, which was the proof of concept for license plate detection and recognition. Here we implemented a pipeline uh, that ran two networks. First one ran on IMX500. It was detecting the license plate. Then this information of the license plates was passed to the Raspberry Pi that first cropped the input image um, ran additional network on it to detect already the characters inside each license plate, and then did the post-processing to collect the content of license plate to be visualized or stored outside. As a result, in this pipeline, we obtain uh, the result in one go without the need to shift uh, to switch the networks on the same device. And now, since AI, uh, since Raspberry Pi AI camera has been released to the public, uh, you can implement similar workflows uh, at home. And I think the laptop decided that it doesn't want to listen to me. No, it does. Uh, so how do you do that? I mean, you've heard that you need to convert a model, you need to deploy it. Uh, how do you do that? Which tools can we use there? Well, of course, it depends how deep you want to go and which steps you want to perform. If you just want to take some already existing model that was built, optimized, and converted for you, you can take one of the models of Model Zoo and then deploy it using local console the tool that we already mentioned to you, and we demoed in our booth. If you want to uh, bring your own model and uh, convert it to work with IMX500, there, is a there are the list of tools on the upper line. The model compression toolkit, IMX500 converter, packager, and local console. All of the tools from the upper uh, Upper lanes are available for free. And then if you want to extend to a bigger fleet of devices, you can use either some um, training service like Local Studio or Studio that would output your already optimized model. And uh, you can even introduce them in the online console. All those tools are available either through the links on the, on the previous slide or uh, by their descriptions in the iTunes developer website. I highly recommend you to look for details about it uh, through this QR code. And if you have already came across them and tried them, I will gladly accept questions and answer them. But before that, let me give you some key takeaways. In the first part, Ru talked to you about how WebAssembly helps to uh, solve problems in developing Edge AI solutions and provide a lightweight, a portable, and secure sandbox solution. You also heard about the efforts uh, on, on simplifying this process uh, and uh, introducing YC and Python support. Uh, later, I showed you the use cases, how 
the success cases, how IMX 500 enabled, how IMX 500 enabled uh, using Vision AI on constrained edge devices, and then you saw the list of of the toolkit AI provides to build and manage AI on edge. I really hope you try some of those tools and let us know your opinion. So now uh, I'll gladly accept your questions and feedback. Uh, we are using, uh, uh, this session is recorded, so please, please use this mic for QA. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, my question is about compiling Python code into Wasm. Um, I previously tried the same thing, but I failed because um, it's too hard for me to manage uh, heap memory allocated by Python runtime. So my question is how to isolate heap memory allocated by Python runtime, micro Python runtime? That is a question that we cannot answer, I think, at this point. However, the, we do, that, that's, the best thing I can, I can put it is that uh, I have to consult the engineer that worked on that to give you precise, I don't wanna give you some wrong answer here. So if you can come to, uh, come here after the, after the session, maybe we can talk about it and I can, um, find the right answer with, through the right channel. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And I think your approach is, uh, there are two good points. I think the first one is latency, and second one is low power consumption. And I want to know um, how these points are well, and I want to see, I want to know the evaluation or kind of thing. Do you have any kind of evaluation about latency or power consumption? We don't have that data with me right now, but I, so we do have a booth over there yeah. with, uh, uh, that's, we're showcasing IMAX 500 with the devices. Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of the top of my head, but I think we can get that for you. Mm -hmm. That's been done. Thank you. Well, these are tough questions. Uh, thank you for presentation. Um, uh, I can understand that um, Python can compile to uh, Watson, but um, in machine learning, I uh, use using um, NumPy and um, PyTorch. The that, that libraries can um, implement it um, native, uh, not pure Python. So I, I cannot understand <laughs> why uh, learn that library. Uh, in right. What was the runtime? Right. Yeah. So, so that's true. So the, the you know Wasm doesn't like so Wasm is not dynamic, right? So so if you're on Python, you would run it and it would try to load up load up those uh you know NumPy, you know SOs, mm -hmm. whatever, right? Yeah. So, so with Wasm, you can't do that. You have to run as a single binary. So yes, you have to have. Uh, so there there's work being done. So what you really need, what we want to have, is to have this NumPy with with Wasm as a target, you know, WASI target mm -hmm. hosted somewhere. So what should happen is when you launch a, um, a Wasm application, you would sort of bring in these dependencies of, of native libraries that the Wasm can, can uh, compile with mm -hmm. prior to running, right? So you would form a single binary before you run it. So if you look in the internet, there, there are actually people working on this. You know, there is actually NumPy for, for WASI as well. But uh, obviously, you know, more people have to be involved to to make this ecosystem, you know, fully. So yes, you're right. So right now you have to sort of link everything together first, but uh, hopefully you have this ecosystem in Python where you can bring those in dynamically. 
mm. but prior to execution. Thank you. Uh, when you are uh, presenting capabilities, I'm wondering um, there will be on a on the roadmap of development uh, any additional uh, features and capabilities in the near future. Capabilities of devices. Yep. Devices or wasn't? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, in the uh, w on the models. On the models. Ah, on the models. You mean? I'm wondering about anomaly detection, especially. Well, so I assume we already have support for anomaly detection because uh, with the uh, uh, local studio we can obtain an anomaly detection a detection mo uh, model, and uh, basically that's the one that is being displayed in the booth. However, I haven't interacted with this model. I'm not sure which particular, how exactly it is implemented, what is the input and what is the output. So um, I'll yeah, have yeah, to we'll consult it. Doing that at, at the booth, it's a little cookie and a little defect, you know, defect, and it's yeah. So it, I guess if you want to know more about that, you can we can talk about that and explain. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so I guess it's time. So we're ending here. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, thank you.